My name is Che Wei Wu. I'm a proud shareholder from right here in Omaha. One of the most interesting financial news developments this previous year was the near collapse of the hedge fund long-term capital. I'd like to get your thoughts and Mr. Munger's thoughts about how these private partnerships operate, um, what your thoughts about the long-term capital deal, and also the Fed's uh, uh, intervention to save it. Yeah, that, in that movie you saw, uh, the time when Yellowstone was, uh, when Old Faithful was, uh, was uh, performing in the background and, and Bill was trying to get me to watch that while I was on the phone. A lot of that trip was spent um, talking uh, to New York about uh, uh, making a bid for what we'll call LTCM, long-term capital management. And the, the, the caption on that photo, is, incidentally, is known as the geezer and the geyser. Uh, the <laughs> and we were up in, we started in Alaska, and we were going down these canyons in, in a boat, and the, the, uh, the captain say, now, you know, let's go over there and look at the sea lines, and I'd say, let's stay right where we are, where we've got a satellite channel, because I was trying to talk on the phone all the time. Charlie was in Hawaii, and uh, we never did get a chance to talk during that whole, that whole period. Uh, I, I didn't want to bother him with a little thing like a bid for 100 billion plus of securities, and I couldn't find him. Um, so it was, we were in an awkward place to pursue that. I think uh, it's possible that if I'd been in New York or Charlie had been in New York during that period that, uh, that our bid might have been accepted. There was just a report published within the last three or four days by a special committee uh, representing the, uh, the SEC, the Fed, uh, I think the Treasury and the CFTC, I think I'm right on those four. And it, uh, it describes a, just a tiny bit of the events leading to the bid. It referred to our, it referred in on page 14, I remember it talked about uh, our transaction unraveling. It didn't unravel from our side. I mean, we made a firm bid for, for 100 billion plus of balance sheet assets and uh, many hundreds of billions, in fact, over a trillion of derivative contracts. And, uh, um, you know, this was in a market where, where prices were moving around very dramatically. And with that bulk of assets there, uh, we thought we made a fairly good bid for a 45-minute or hour period. I don't think anybody else would have made the bid. But in any event, the, uh, the people at LTCM um, took the position that they could not accept that bid. Um, and therefore, the New York Fed uh, in, had a group uh, of largely investment banks there at, at, at the Fed. And, and that afternoon, uh, faced with the prospect that LTCM could not or would not accept our bid, they, they uh, uh, arranged another uh, uh, takeover arrangement where additional money was put in. Um, it's interesting, if you, read, if you read that report, which is put together by these four uh, very eminent bodies, and I think on the first page, it says that the first so-called hedge fund, which is the term generally applied to entities like LTCM, first hedge fund was set up in 1949. Uh, and I probably read that or heard that 50 times uh, in the last, particularly in the last year. And of course, that's not true at all. And I've even pointed this out once or twice before, but Ben Graham had, and Jerry Newman, had a classical hedge fund back in the 20s. And I worked for, I worked dually for a company called Graham Newman Corp, which was a, a regulated investment company, and Newman and Graham, which was an investment partnership with a uh, I think a 20% participation in profits and, and exactly the sort of uh, entity that uh, today is called a hedge fund. So if you, if you read any place that the hedge fund concept originated in 1949, uh, presumably with A.W. Jones, uh, uh, it's, a, it, it's not an accurate uh, history. There are now, I ran something that would generally be called uh, uh, a hedge fund. I, I didn't like to think of it that way. I, I called it an investment partnership, but it would have been termed an hedge fund. Charlie ran one uh, from about, what, 1963 to mid-70s or thereabouts. And they have proliferated 
in a big way. Did, you, did he blink? Uh, 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 we, we, there are now hundreds of them, and of course it's very enticing to any money manager to run because if you do well, or even if you don't do so well, but the market does well, you can make a lot of money uh, a running one. Uh, this report that just came out uh, has really not, nothing particularly harsh uh, to say about the operation. So I think you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hedge funds. I think the current issue of Barron's may have a recap of how, how a large group did in the first quarter. And uh, there, there's a lot of money in those funds. and. Uh, there's a huge incentive to form them, and there's a huge incentive to go out and attract more money if you, uh, if you run one. And when that condition exists in Wall Street, you can be sure that they won't uh, wither away. Charlie? Yeah, what was interesting about that one is how talented the people were, and yet they got in so much trouble. Uh, I think it also demonstrates uh, that uh, I'd say the general system of finance in America involving derivatives is irresponsible. Uh, there's way too much risk in all these trillions of notational value sloshing around the world. There's no clearing system as there is in a commodities market, and I don't think it's the last convulsion we're going to see in the der derivatives game. It, it's fascinating in that you had. 16 extremely bright, I mean, extremely bright people at the top of that. The average IQ would, would probably be as higher, higher than any organization you could find among their top 16 people. They individually had decades of experience and collectively had centuries of experience in operating in the sort of securities uh, in which the LTCM was invested, and they had a huge amount of money of their own up and probably a very high percentage of their net worth in almost every case up. So here you had super bright, extremely experienced people operating with their own money. And in effect on that day in September they were broke. And that, 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 to me that is absolutely fascinating. There was a book written, You Only Have to Get Rich Once. It's a great title. It's not a very good book. Walter Gutman wrote it, but it uh, many years ago. But the title is right. You only have to get rich once. And why do people, very bright people, risk losing something that's very important to them to gain something that's totally unimportant? The added money has no utility whatsoever. And the money that was lost had enormous utility, and on top of that, reputation is tarnished and all of that sort of thing. So that the, the gain-loss ratio, in any real sense, it's just incredible. I mean, it's like playing Russian roulette. I mean, if, if you hand me a revolver with six bullets and, you know, or six chambers and one bullet, and you say, pull it once for a million dollars, and I say no, and then you say, what is your price? The answer is there is no price. And there shouldn't be any price on taking the risk when you're already rich, particularly of, of, of embarrassment and all of that sort of thing. But people repeatedly do it, and they do it uh, Whenever a bright person, really bright person, goes broke that has a lot of money, it's because of leverage. You simply, you, you, you basically can't, it be almost impossible to go broke uh, without borrowed money being in the equation. And uh, as you know, at Berkshire, we've, we've never used any real amount of borrowed money. Now, if we'd, if we'd used somewhat more, you know, we'd be really rich, but if we'd used a whole lot more, we might have gotten in trouble sometimes. And there's no, there's just no, there's no upside to it, you know. What's two percentage points more, you know, in a given year or that year, uh, and run the risk of, of, uh, of real failure. But very bright people do it, and they do it consistently, and they will continue to do it. And as long as uh, explosive type instruments are out there, uh, they will gravitate toward them, and particularly people will gravitate toward them who have very little to lose but are operating with, with other people's money. One of the things, for example, in the LTCM case, and Charlie mentioned it in terms of derivatives, in, in effect there were ways found to get around the, uh, and they were legal obviously, uh, to get around the margin requirements because uh, risk arbitrage is a business that Charlie and I have been in for 40 years in one form or another. And, 
Normally that means putting up the money to buy the stock on the long side and then shorting something uh, against it that, where you expect a merger or something to happen. But through derivatives, uh, people have found out how to do that, essentially putting up no money just by writing a derivative contract on both sides. And there are margin requirements, as you know, that the Fed promulgates that I believe still call for 50 percent uh, equity on, 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 on stock purchases. But those requirements do not apply if you arrange the transaction in derivative form so that these billions of dollars of positions in equities essentially were being uh, financed 100 percent by the people who wrote the derivative contracts. And that leads to trouble. It does it, you know, 99 percent of the time it works. But, you know, 83 and a third percent of the time it works to play Russian roulette with, with uh, one bullet in there and six chambers. But neither 83 and a third percent or 99 percent is good enough when there is no gain to offset the risk of, of loss. Charlie? I would argue that there uh, is a second factor that makes the situation dangerous, and that is that the accounting for uh, being actively engaged in derivatives, interest rate swaps, et cetera, is uh, very weak. Uh, I think the Morgan Bank was the last holdout, and uh, they finally flipped to a lenient standard of accounting that's favored by people who are sharing in the profits from trading derivatives, and naturally they like liberal accounting. So you got an irresponsible clearing system irresponsible accounting. This is not a good combination. Oh. Yeah, J.P. Morgan shifted their accounting. I think, I, I'm not sure exactly when, around 1990. But Charlie and I, we probably became more familiar with that when we were back at Solomon. And uh, this is absolutely standard. You know, it's gap accounting, but it front ends profits. And uh, if you front end profits and you pay people a percentage of the profits, uh, you're going to get some very interesting results sometimes.